Welcome to Married to History, where we try to be informative, entertaining, and family-friendly. Aloha, I'm Christopher. I have a fancy piece of paper on my wall that says, I know more about history and less about smiling and smirks than most people do. <laughs> I'm Shirley. I'm a homeschool mom that relies on good curriculum, Christopher, and Hamilton the Musical to teach our kids history. Okay, that wasn't a bad musical. I enjoyed that right? one. Listen. Before we get into our episode, let's take a minute to talk about something from a past episode. It's important to keep in mind that Shirley doesn't warn me about our topics beforehand. Yep, it's fun for me to see what he knows right off the top of his head. And that means sometimes we miss things. If you would like to hear a more comprehensive and well-prepared episode on any topic, just let us know. All right, so I don't think you researched anything, right? Do you have anything to add from a past episode? I have no idea what we've discussed before. My brain is a jumble of all manner of history. <laughs> and it's been a long time since we recorded. But there was a lot of things that I had looked up. So, first of all, when we talked about the Ottoman Empire, you brought up Dracula. Mm -hmm. And you um, doubted that Transylvania was a real place. Okay, I recall okay. that. Yeah. I've since learned that. No, Transylvania is a real place. Yeah, so I looked it up. And... So Dracula is always associated with Transylvania, but the inspiration for Dracula, Drac I don't know, I said it weird, like you said, is mm -hmm. Vlad the Impaler. Mm -hmm. He was a prince of Wallachia. Uh, and I want to be clear, Vlad, so Vlad the Impaler is a name that he's probably more commonly known by. His name, though, was Vlad Dracul. Also Vlad the Third. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So he was an inspiration. The, the idea of the, the Dracula name, but that's where it comes from. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, oh, no, I, I apologize. I said that wrong. His name was Vlad Dracula. His dad was Vlad Dracul. Dracul oh. means dragon. Dracula means son of the dragon. Oh, that's cool. I didn't, I didn't find that in my research. Cool. Okay, so... So, he, like you said, he was the Prince of Wallachia, and Wallachia mm -hmm. is a neighboring kingdom. They share a border mm -hmm. with Transylvania. So what's interesting is that, that um, uh, Vlad never owned any land in Transylvania. He has no ties to Transylvania. There's, like, not even any evidence that he ever lived there or anything and, Not even as like a prisoner or a hostage. Well, that's the one. Spent most of his time in the Ottoman in the Ottoman uh, hostage. Yeah. Right. So that is the one possible link. So, but it's even it's even more tenuous than that because okay. Bran Castle in Transylvania. It's like near the border, I guess. With yeah, Wallachia. you told me about this. Yeah. And... So Bran Castle is what the tourists call Dracula's castle, but. There's no evidence that Bram Stoker knew, knew anything about Bran Castle. It doesn't look anything like the castle that Bram Stoker uh, describes. And, again, Vlad never owned it. He maybe was held hostage there for a short time. Maybe. But, yeah, that's it. <laughs> but everyone visits Transylvania and goes to Bran Castle and is like, this is where Dracula lives. It's not. I hate At to all. ruin it for a lot of people out there, but that's what most of your tourist traps are. I should probably yeah. shouldn't say most. That's what a lot of tourist traps are. They have no actual connection to something or other, but yeah. but the people in the area or the people that are in charge of the site, they encourage mm -hmm. the story so that people keep coming back. Oh, yeah. It's a smart tourism strategy yeah. for sure. Okay. So then another thing I wanted to bring up, we had some questions about nurses in the military. We did? From our MASH episode. Oh, okay. Yes. So I we looked up a bunch of MASH. stuff. Yeah. Oh, all right. It's been a long time since we recorded last. <laughs> well, like I said, all, all the history just jumbles together. <laughs> yep. Okay, so we had kind of wondered what the survival rate was thanks to MASH units. Oh, okay, I do. So yeah, the show had purported a uh, 97, 98% rate. Right. So this is what I found. MASH units are credited with reducing deaths from battle wounds by 50% compared to World War II. Oh, cool. So yeah, that is a big jump. Yep. All right. Um, we also wondered about the percent of male versus female nurses in the military today. Mm -hmm. So in 2012, so it could even be different um, now. That was 10 years ago. The Army reported that 35% of active duty nurses and 28% of Army Reserve nurses were male. And... That is compared to 5.4% of the general nurse. 
oh, computer made a noise, general nursing population. So there's definitely more male nurses in the military, or in the army specifically today than there was back then. And there's, if you're a nurse, like a male nurse, there's more of you in the army than there is in the general nursing population. Which doesn't surprise me. I'm, I'm probably going to sound, I don't know what the word is, racist, sexist, whatever the case might be. Racist. <laughs> I I was thinking, misogynist. I was thinking of all the bad words. Okay, misogynist <laughs> there. Like, it doesn't surprise me that more, uh, that there are a larger number of men mm -hmm. nurses in the army than there are women. Well, Because the army is still traditionally thought of as a manly thing. Well, no. So there's not, if you look at all of the nurses in the army, the mm -hmm. majority of them are women. No, yeah. Yeah, but there's a larger percentage of men in the army versus out of the army. No, and that's yeah. what I was getting to. Okay. A larger number of men yeah. would be like, or would want to associate with the, I, I don't know what I'm saying. If you're a male nurse, you're me, more, more likely to do it in the military. There. <laughs> yes. Because I imagine the military pays better. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I know, it would depend. It would Nurses depend on, do? It would depend they on your should situation. be paid more. Nurse, I, I believe that nurses do make plenty of money, but like when you're in the military, then uh, assuming that you're taking full advantage of all the benefits, then you're not paying rent because you're living on base. You're not paying for your yeah. utilities and whatnot because you're living on base. Yeah, that would be interesting to compare that. Like, with what is the better deal for your career? Okay, uh, another nursing fact. Um, okay, so looking at the Vietnam War and the Korean War, in the Viet... Well, let's begin with Korean because that happened first. When the Korean War began in June 1950, women in the armed services were about 22,000 worldwide. And about 7,000 of those women were healthcare professionals. Okay. We were wondering about, like, were all women in the military there because they were nurses? So that... I don't remember wondering that. Yeah, I, I wondered I, it. Oh, okay. I, was <laughs> I, I believe the majority of them were probably wax. What are wax? Women army, women army correspondents. At least that, I believe that's what the wax is for. Are those for. journalists? Uh, secretaries, basically. Okay. Yeah, so that was that was the case in the Korean War. I, I And I had asked you about this. Um, I remember when I found this figure because... I'm surprised there were 22,000 women in the military and only 7,000 were in healthcare. Mm. And so you said it was because they were whack. Does that, was that number so big because we were just coming off the World War II? Uh, that number was so big probably because, or as far as the number of secretaries, yeah. yes, probably because we were coming off the of World War II. As far as so many women, because at that point in time, that was still women's work, the secretary jobs. Right. Okay. The men needed to be, if, uh, if there were going to be people in the army, uh, then you wanted the women to be the secretaries mm -hmm. and you wanted the men to be the ones holding the guns. Well, yeah. That Not the other way around. How it was. <laughs> okay. But this is a big difference to with the Vietnam War because Vietnam, there was about 11,000 military women. So that's half of the number I said for Korea. And 90% of those were... In healthcare, mm -hmm. so huge difference there. Is that because all the wax had been fired by then, <laughs> or what? I do not know well enough, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if there was less of a need for wax, or less of a need for anybody in the secretary type field mm -hmm. because of a couple of things. First off, improvements in technology with typewriters, radios, whatever other communication methods and filing systems and whatnot they might have had, mm -hmm. and secondly. That probably did fall towards uh, towards staff soldiers also. Oh. Instead of it being like a, or, uh, so, uh, officers, commanding officers have had staffs since at least as far back as the days of Wellington. I'm, mm -hmm. Commanding officers always had like their assistants, their second charges yeah. or whatnot. Their guys like who do Hamilton things for them. to Washington. Yeah. But if I remember correctly, the, well, uh, sorry. If I remember correctly, though, like the idea of a staff, like the complete staff to do all manner of things, Wellington was the one who didn't invent that, but like perfected it. So he created the example that would be followed after that. And uh, my understanding is that by the time of Vietnam, there would have been more corporals, sergeants, and uh, lieutenants and whatnot that mm -hmm. would have been given those kind of clerical jobs for the generals and whatnot. So there were okay. less whacks. Why that would have happened, I don't know. There's probably a million different reasons under the sun for why they would have wanted less women secretaries and have uh, active army personnel mm -hmm. already uh, doing the job instead. 
Might have also just been because maybe too many generals got into hot water because oh. of their associations with wax in previous decades. Yeah, that's... I, I would be interested to see a, a, re a research paper on the subject. Yeah. Okay. So then my last thing oh, about... Actually, I apologize. It could have also yeah. been because of uh, civil rights movements, uh, the and the attitude about, uh, w uh, about women and... Um, uh, especially in sexualization and whatnot mm -hmm. it had been changing by the time the Vietnam War started. Oh, yeah. There's a lot going on socially, politically. Oh, and there again, that answers another question, too. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot more women avoided enlisting in the army or helping out in the army during the Vietnam because Vietnam was a very unpopular war. So men were oh. there because they, a lot of them got drafted, those that didn't run, uh, run off. But women wouldn't have had to have been drafted in, so unless I'm yeah. mistaken, the only women that would have been there would have been volunteers. 90% of them were nurses. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that's interesting. You should look it up more and uh, fill us in on all the details. The only, <laughs> the only story I remember off the top of my head about draft dodgers is one that I'm loath to share. <laughs> well, now you have to share. Okay, I'm a fan <laughs> of Sylvester Stallone. Okay. I, I, I like his movies. I like not all of them. I like a lot of his movies. Yeah, I, like I mean, the, the Terminator movies. was awesome. What? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong action star? Oh, you just offended so many people. You can't do that high-pitched... <laughs> that's going to blow people's headphones out. <laughs> no, he was not in Terminator, I know, though. that was Arnold. There, there was a cute... Uh, Thing they did in one of Arnold's other movies where, uh, and Last Action Hero where they pretended that Sylvester Stallone was the star. So I thought oh. that was a cute little movie poster. Uh, so, Anyways, Rocky. Anyway, I'm a fan of his movies. I like the Rocky movies. I love the Expendables movies. His, uh, one of his more recent projects. That was Arnold awesome. was in that one too. Yes, Arnold was in that one. I know something. Uh, Never watched he did it. something else recently. Oh, the, he's got a new show on the Tulsa King. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of no it. Uh, I've enjoyed it. It's, it's funny. I, I liked it so far. Um, but uh, if I now, granted, I don't know that I ever did the research on my own to confirm this or whatnot. But I believe he was a draft dodger. He was ran he? off to Canada instead of staying to be drafted. And then when he oh. came back and was Rambo in some of his more popular <laughs> movies, people were ticked off because a draft yeah. dodger is playing this Vietnam vet going through. PTSD is amongst other things. That is a little messed up. But now I'm going to look it up because if he wasn't a draft dodger and you're just like defaming him, yeah, that would be bad. That would be bad. Is he famously uh, lit lit litigious? Litigious? Yeah, is he going to sue us? I have no idea. Sylvester Stallone, draft Are we making money dodger? off of this? We're not. No, so we're not. He can't, so he can't. Um, well, he could. I suppose he could still sue us for libel or slander. Okay, so the top result on Google says he was able to avoid the draft entirely. I don't know why. I'll have to read that later. Okay, so maybe I'm wrong about him running off to Canada then, but all right, he avoided the draft. So my details yeah. might be wrong. Either way, he but didn't is, serve. But it is true that he did not serve, and if I believe correctly, people were offended that he was cast as this yeah. Vietnam veteran. But as an actor, the whole idea is that you are playing a character that you yeah. are not actually. See, and you and I know that and can agree on that. I, this is one of the things why I find it hilarious, kind of the current motif of, oh, certain actors or actresses can't play this character or that character because they don't have something physical or something emotional or some other connection to them. But, or whatnot. And my thought is, but I thought that was the job of actors, was to play people they are not, was to convince you that they yeah. are not. And they do a good job on that, not because they have a realistic connection to the person that they're playing, but because of talent. Yeah, and and we're not going to talk more about that because then that gets messy. One of my, I, I, I remember one of my favorite jokes along that line. Uh, huh. This was uh, this was back when the movie Ray came out. Jamie Foxx was playing um, uh, Ray, Ray Charles. Ray Charles, yeah. And I, I don't think I've seen that movie yet. That's uh, a bugger. Yeah. I gotta fix that. So uh, I remember when it was coming out um, uh, on the Daily Show because mm -hmm. I was a fan of the Daily Show at the time. Uh, John Stewart and uh, Stephen Colbert, who was still on the show at the time, did a little bit where um, 
I don't remember exactly how it came up, but Stephen Colbert uh, was protesting about Jamie Foxx being cast to play Ray. Yeah. He says, no, nah, no, nah, that that char- that character should be played by the actor who it was written for, Hugh Grant. Oh, jeez. <laughs> to which John Stewart asks, like, why would Hugh Grant possibly be cast to play Ray Charles? And Stephen Colbert, without skipping a beat, said, talent. <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. Okay, so back to nurses, though. (laughs) Okay, so I tried to look up whether or not nurses were automatically made officers in the Korean conflict. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find a really authoritative source, so I'm not sure. And it was kind of complicated, but basically, like... Maybe we'll get lucky and a veteran will be listening to the show. That would be awesome. So I know that the nurse corps didn't even exist until, oh, shoot, I didn't write it down, like 1901 or 1910, something like that. So when the nurse corps was made in the Army, and of course the Army and the Air Force and the Navy, they all have their own nursing corps. Um, When that was first made, they were kind of in this like no man's land, like this dead zone of like, what are they? Because they're not soldiers, and they're not officers, but they need some kind of a label. So they did start giving them officer labels. And if what I read was correct, it sounds like today, if you have an RN, or a BSN, Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, mm-hmm. and you're a registered RN, then you would enter the military as an officer. But if you have a lesser nursing degree, then you wouldn't necessarily, I guess. So again, if someone understands it better and can explain it, that would be interesting. I am curious on how it is today and how it was in the past. So there you go. And okay, so the very last thing, very last thing about nurses, and then we'll move so we've on. We've almost done an entire episode's I know. worth of time, and we haven't gotten to anything I yet. know. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so very last thing. I have to brag about this lady that I went to church with growing up. I can't remember if you remember me talking about her, but Alta Hart, she was the organist when I was growing up, um, and she was awesome. My dad would always say that, like, she was a full bird colonel, and, like, he was so proud of that. So, anyways, I looked it up. She died many years ago. All of and... the colonels were proud if they got to full bird. Nobody wanted to retire as a lieutenant. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so not many years ago. She died two years ago. And, um, so I looked up her obituary. This lady was awesome. So she became a nurse, right? She had, a, a nursing career for six years working with a world renowned heart surgeon, cardiologist and, and vascular surgeon. Is that Russell Nelson? Yes. <laughs> if you know Russell M. Nelson, like he was right there at the forefront of like open heart surgeries and like making all these advances. And then one of his surgeries is mentioned in an episode of MASH. Charles right? Winchester t- uh, performs the operation and yep. tries to teach the other doctors how to do it. Yep. So Russell M. Nelson was right there, like figuring all that out. And she was working with him. This lady, Elta Hart, she was like, his nurse, like they, they were doing it together. So anyways, she's awesome. And then after that, she joined the the Air Force and she was a nurse there for 20 years. She was tending to wounded soldiers being air backed out of Vietnam in the 60s. And so she was doing that and she became a full bird colonel. She was a very cool. cool lady. I wish I had like really understood how cool she was when she was little or when I was little. That's the price we pay about being young. <laughs> right? Her husband was awesome. I remember him, too. He wasn't a full bird colonel in the military, but he would give us candy if we helped clean up the pews after church. I don't remember church. where I heard this, <laughs> but uh, somebody... Oh, I think it was it was, it was was in the movie Red Tails by uh, the actor who who's your boy in Hamilton who plays Aaron Burr. Oh, yeah. I don't remember his name. Oh, I'm forgetting all so of a sudden. He's, uh, he says something about uh, life is a cruel teacher. It gives the test first and then the lesson. You got the test first, but then we learned the lesson about, oh, we should have appreciated our elderly people only afterwards. Yep, that's how it goes. Okay, now, since... I shouldn't have said our elderly people. Our elders. (laughs) Our elders. All right, so since we've spent a lot of time on this, we don't have uh, time to do a full um, regular topic. No, since we could still do a full regular topic. 
Is, is there a crime if an episode is a little bit longer? I don't want to do a long episode. Okay, well now you're just kind of making our... What kind of a product are we <laughs> offering the people if we don't even want to do it? I'm thinking people don't want to listen to us ramble for more than half an hour. Alright, fine. At a time. Fine, fine. <laughs> okay, I do have a very important question, though. Really? How I important do. is it, honey? Okay, I have, How I, important is I, it? I have a question. Are you ready to hear right. it? Uh, give me strength. Okay. Hit you me. ready? Hit me with it. Why are historians so condescending? What? <laughs> we are not condescending! Okay, history textbooks. Why, and maybe condescending isn't the right word, but why are history textbooks so certain when they have no right to be so certain? We have plenty of right to be certain. No, no, I mean, and you, we've talked about this before, and this is why I get frustrated, hold up, <laughs> I get frustrated with studying history, because you'll read something or listen to a historian say, this person did this because they felt this, with complete certainty, and it feels kind of condescending because they're the expert, I'm the student, but I want to raise my hand and go, but how do you know? Like, you're not allowed to know that unless the person wrote in their journal and we have the, the primary source saying, I did this because I felt this. You can't say that with certainty. Like, especially if, if you go all the way back to, um, like, cavemen. Horrible Histories does this a lot. As much as I love Horrible Histories, they do do this a lot because they're trying to simplify things for kids. And so they had a scene about, like, a caveman burial, a Stone Age burial, and, like, describing all these things that were found in the grave and, like, how the body was positioned and stuff. And they're like, this means that cavemen did this. And I'm thinking, maybe that weird-shaped rock just fell into the hole before they put the dirt in. Like, maybe it wasn't significant, but we act as if it absolutely is significant and there's no way you can convince us otherwise. But it was so long ago, how do we know? We can't know. We can only think we know. We can have ideas. Okay, go ahead. Set me straight. Really, am I allowed to speak now? I'm done ranting. All right, so uh, first off, for some of these, I think you already answered your own question. You mentioned simplifying it for kids. So as far as like textbooks are concerned for the grades- Textbooks are the worst. Go ahead. I thought you said this was my turn <laughs> to speak. It's your turn. It is. As far as textbooks are concerned mm -hmm. for like the K through 12 level, yeah. well, two things. First off, yes, they're trying to simplify it for kids. Yeah. And second off, those are controlled by the state, or I shouldn't say controlled by the state. They are published by private companies yeah. who want the state to buy them. So but it doesn't, it's, I know I interrupted. It's not that hard to say historians think and then state your thing. It's two extra words. That's it. That's all I'm asking for. Historians think. And then the fact, quote fact. Go Am ahead. I allowed to speak now? Go this ahead. is like what the third time yes. I had to ask and be sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, the problem with that though is that that would encourage kids to think. <laughs> Believe it or not, the public school system, which of which I am highly critical, the public school system, which is you're much a part of. As, I'm not part of the public school system. Well, true. As much as it proclaims that it wants children to be able to think, no, yeah. it really doesn't want children to be able to think. Yeah. It wants children to be able to it, it wants children to be able to solve puzzles. I'll give them that. It wants children to know certain things, yeah. know certain facts, but it is really not geared toward teaching them to think independently. Yeah. I'm not saying that there aren't some teachers that do it and do it well. I'm not saying that there aren't some schools out there that do it and do it well, but by and large, the public school system is not rigged to teach children to think. It is. Mhm. Mm and I'm not going to use the word indoctrinate either because I think that's a ridiculous one. <laughs> oh, homeschoolers love to use that word. <laughs> it, it, it is it is, it is, is designed to be something that is there, not necessarily... To, it, it is designed for the people that benefit being... It is designed for the teachers and the administration and the politicians who fuel it yeah. and the, and the co private companies that make the things that get bought for it. It yeah. is not about what is best for the kids. Yeah, hot take. So, after that, though, when you get into the college level, uh -huh. this is the answer to your question. Okay. All right, what's the highest degree you've ever completed? 
You want me to say publicly? That's embarrassing. <laughs> Let me rephrase my question then. Have you ever had to write a thesis and defend it before professors? I got an AA. I almost had a second AA, and I've never written a thesis. So Okay, so the answer to my question is no. <laughs> the reason why history papers, history books, mm -hmm. are written the way they are is because everybody who's written a... the the uh, valuable, a, uh, a quotable... A, I'm trying... I'm struggling for a good word here. Everybody who's w written a good book, a creditable book, there we go, mm -hmm. that uh, about history was the type of person that had to do that, yeah. who had to write a thesis. Often cases, the books are their thesis, maybe yeah. a little bit more expounded on than when they originally presented them, but that's what it was. They had to present their thesis in front of a panel, mm -hmm. and they weren't... Al I don't know if it's that they aren't allowed to do this during their mm -hmm. thesis, or it's just a style choice, you don't do this during your thesis, they're not allowed to say, oh, I might be wrong, or oh, we can't know. They're supposed to say during this panel and prove this panel, because this yeah. panel is going to throw questions at them, they're supposed to prove that, no, I'm right. And that's the way it's done. There, It is oh. rare to encounter people that go through that, in my opinion at least, mm -hmm. it is rare to encounter people that go through that experience and then are able afterwards to have a good conversation. And that's hard mm -hmm. to do, and even if the, there are people that are willing to have that conversation, I love those kind of people, I hope that I am that type of person. Yeah. When you're writing it in a book... It's hard to do that, though, because you don't have those questions coming at you. Yeah. When you're writing your book, you can try to prepare for questions that are coming at you, put some things in there to kind of argue against those mm -hmm. questions and show why, okay, no, we're reasonably sure that this happened because of this, that, or mm -hmm. the other thing. But it's hard to do in the book itself, which is why, to this day, there are critics yeah. Books get criticized all the time. History books get criticized all the time. And then it becomes kind of a bit of a, a today I guess would be kind of a, like an online or in the press <laughs> shouting match where one historian or one expert yeah. on something, not just in history, is going to say, no, this is my expertise, I'm right. And other people are going to say, no, this is my expertise, I'm right. Like say, oh, I don't know, a doctor of virology over here and another doctor of virology <laughs> over no, there. No, we're not getting into Both that. Are, oh, nope. Let me finish, let me finish. <laughs> okay. Both both of them have the experience. Both of them know, I would hope, no stuff, if not know everything about their stuff, yeah. but they're going to argue sometimes about which one of them is right and which one of them is wrong. Both of them are so certain right. that they are right and the other guy is wrong. Okay, but here's... That's life. But that's the problem. That's what disgusts me because if I read one history book and that becomes my knowledge of this event. Some other historian or some other person who read another historian's book is gonna tell me I'm wrong. I might be wrong, but this is what I learned. And, and the problem is why are historians arguing about it? Why can't both of them be open to the idea that both theories are valid? Because we can't know. Well, there again, I'd say it's not a historian thing. It's a pride thing, which is human. And that's the problem. And but and, honey, honey, but when pride comes into it, you're, our you're, kids. You're suffer. talking about this like this is history alone. Pride affects every field. I know, and I know like that was, this. and I know that was and your have point. Have I ever done this to you? <laughs> I, I would hope that I am the most dedicated and loving historian that you have ever met. Have I ever done that to you? No. Just walk up to you and tell you, you're wrong. No, you have Despite the fact that you've been wrong a lot. <laughs> I have been wrong a lot. And I'm sure you have when it was correct <laughs> to tell me I'm wrong. But, okay. Oh, I like that time when you asked me if anybody died in the Cold War and I blew up at you. Okay, that's a fair one. Yes. That was on an episode. <laughs> that, that was fair. That was very fair to tell me I was wrong. But no, and I, and I get that that... That the pride was your point about bringing up virologists, but like, I know that it's everywhere, but for some reason it just really gets in my craw with history because like in a science field, we can continue to do experiments and find more facts. But in history, we can't get in a time machine and go back to that Stone Age burial and ask Yet. them, why did you put that rock in there? Yet is the key word there. I'm not Yet. saying that I'm one of those people that would go back in time. <laughs> I'd be too afraid of messing things up. Right. But I don't, but like if we could if we could get like a time machine that was like an observation balloon, I would love to go back in time and just fly just over observe. certain cities, battlefields, castles, yeah. uh, other places just to see 
But even then, even Sorry, then... Sorry, I, I was diverting from you. No, no, no. <laughs> That's a good example. Because even then, if you were in an observation balloon and you saw on the battlefield one of the generals, like, scratch his nose, you might go, he scratched his nose as a signal to his troops to do this. Maybe he was just scratching his nose. But that would be an odd jump to conclusions. You I would, would have, have to, to observe that several times and observe a reaction. Yeah, uh, maybe he has times. allergies. Maybe he has allergies and it's just... Correlation, not okay, causation, well, that his troops moved in a certain way. I'm saying you can't know unless you get out of the balloon. Ask that general, why do you keep scratching your nose? And history can't do that. Yeah, I can't But they do that. act probably, as if they can. Probably kill me as a spy. <laughs> but they act as if they can. No. I, mean, I can see it now. I just walk up to, uh, who, who's a good one? Um, let's see here. I'm trying to think. What's a good one? I, I don't can go know. With. If I were to just uh, walk up to oh, uh, Hannibal, if I just walk up to him and said, dude, all right, so I was up in the sky watching at Kanai, <laughs> and I got to say, that was some brilliant tactics, dude. How do you, yeah, he probably would have killed me. Yeah. Yep. So you can't know. Sure, if you're going to go back in time that far, you got to bring a gun because a boomstick is something that might scare them enough to not kill you immediately. <laughs> but then that would be altering history. <sighs> yes. That's the problem with time machines. The point is, I just need all historians to just preface everything they say with, we think. That's all I'm asking. Is that so much to ask? Unf I do not think so. I've said this before, I hope, and I hope I will say it again many times. I am always open to the idea that I could be wrong about things. And I you're know, one of the good ones. And I welcome the conversation that will come from that where somebody who does think that I'm right. wrong about something, we can sit down with as many other people that mm -hmm. want to be here and have a discussion about it and maybe come to a consensus or even if we don't agree on everything, yeah. at least we have exchanged ideas that have the ability to further influence our ideas mm -hmm. and how we think about things. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this, so the, uh, this this is uh, called historiography. Okay. It's the study of how the, history has been studied. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember there was a huge change in the way that we understood World War II and the way we were learning about World War II okay. after the Berlin Wall came down. Okay. After the commun after the Russian communist, the USSR basically collapsed under itself, all of a sudden a whole bunch of records that the USSR had been keeping yeah. close knit and tight under lock and key. Yeah became available right and this changed so much of what we understood about what was going on because right. all of a sudden we had a whole bunch of new data historians that's that's exactly what should happen mm -hmm. any historian out there i'll use myself i'm very committed in what i know about the american civil war for example because mm -hmm. i've studied it an awful lot i've right. read lots of books lots of theories lots of people on the Civil War, and I'm very committed to a lot of my understanding. Uh -huh. But I would jump at the opportunity for someone else to suddenly have found this whole new cache of data that we've never looked at before mm -hmm. and take a look at that. And that happens from time to time. I get new books, I get new information, I read it, and one of two things is going to happen. Either I'm going to say, okay, yeah, I've heard that, I yeah. agree with that, that's cool. Or I'm going to see something, I'm like, Okay, I've never heard of that before. That's new, yeah. and I'm going to do one or two things with that. Either I'm going to do some more research if I can find some more stuff to see if I can get anything to, to corroborate reinforce, it. to corroborate what this new piece of information I've said, or go through again everything that I've already looked at, as well as some additional new things if I can find them, and say, yeah, it's an interesting theory, but I don't believe in it because for me, or at least to me, this, that, and these other facts, these other bits of data that I have, yeah. uh, make a compelling argument that no, this was not the case. Right. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about with the, the caveman and the rock thing, because <laughs> weren't we just talking about a while ago where uh, a bunch of film critics were picking apart just oh the pose of this God. lady in a film, oh and she flat gosh. out committed like, no, you're all overthinking this. I was yes. just a poor college student and made a quick film. Yes, it was I, my, The posture of my hand had nothing to do with the character I was trying to portray. Yes. So, just be, so <laughs> uh, in addition to pride, I would say overthinking yeah. is a huge problem yeah. that goes across all fields today. True. True. We definitely see that in literature now that you bring up that girl in the, the video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes the blue curtains are just blue. Yep. And there's no reason for it. They're just blue. 
Uh, okay, so since you bring up like your um, your expertise in history, I know in the past you've told my me my expertise yes. in history. That fancy piece of paper. <laughs> I know in the past that you've told me that you consider yourself a macro historian. Yes. Can you explain to us what that means? So I do not know if there is a more legitimate term or whatnot. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a macro historian because uh, it is my belief from my understanding and from what I love about history that you are going to find people that know more about specific stuff than mm -hmm. I do. You will find plenty of people that know more about the Civil War than I do, mm -hmm. about World War II, the Korean War, about the Renaissance, about the Roman Empire, mm -hmm. about Right, because they specialize. China. Yeah, yeah. You, you will find plenty of people that know infinitely more than I do about all those things. Mm -hmm. But I am firm in my belief that I understand the big picture better yeah. than most people. I am firm in my belief that I understand how the storyline, all mm -hmm. the details and whatnot, or at least a lot, a significant number of the details, of how we got from cavemen to our present day. Right. I believe that I have a better understanding of the world's events and how they work together, how they influenced one mm -hmm. another to come to that conclusion. That's why I yeah. consider myself a macro historian. And that's cool. And, and a lot of people that I follow or our joint account, which you've never been on, follow on TikTok, <laughs> are those specialized micro historians. I don't want to log into Tickety Talk. You should. I don't, I don't some, understand that There's concept. some good stuff there. Okay, other people have fun with that. I'm cool <laughs> with that. <laughs> Anyways, Dude, there's... When was it that you finally got me to get a cell phone, and then you, uh, like, 10 recently. years after that, you finally got me to give up on a flip phone? Yeah, I'm, very recently. This is my defense. I, <laughs> I remember, I think I told you this story mm -hmm. once. When I was in college, uh, or when I was uh, going through to get my teaching credential... Um, uh, I don't, I was talking to one of my professors and for some reason I had to take out my phone for yeah. some reason. He took one look at my phone and said, you're going to be a history teacher, aren't you? I'm like, yeah. It's like, you guys are the only ones I see so they're still using flip phones. <laughs> it's true. Anyways, there's a tons of creator on TikTok, creators, I, I know how to pluralize things, on TikTok that are specialists in like one thing, like Gaelic literature or like the Tudor era, and they don't necessarily are are as knowledgeable about the big picture on what led to the Tudor era and what led us out and how those things affected future. So I, just, I think maybe that's what helps make you less condescending because you readily admit you don't know the details. You don't know why Catherine Howard wore her hair like that in that one painting. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> right, so you you readily admit you don't know those details because you haven't studied those details. So you have to be open-minded and willing to lean on the people who specialized in order to make your big picture. Is that fair? I suppose that's fair. Okay. Last thing relevant to this conversation is presentism. One of our listeners, our friend Andy, he mentioned this in our after listening to our first episode that something that um, people should avoid when they're studying history is presentism. Mm -hmm. So what is that? Presentism is the practice of judging the past by today's standards. So but isn't wrong always wrong? No why can't we? No judge because by right today? right and wrong are subjective. okay see we think, that right and wrong are not subjective, but no, they very much are. Mm -hmm. um, right, um, I'm trying to think of some good examples. Right and wrong are influenced more by culture. Some people claim that, no, 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 there's like a universal rule of what is right and what is wrong. Right. And that's absurd. There is not a universal rule. Most of what people know about right and wrong is influenced, I kid you not, by their religious ideology. Mm -hmm. even Especially those, through history. Even those people who claim that they're not religious will, believe it or not, the, the thing that's forming your moral background, mm -hmm. if not an actual religion that the world would recognize as a religion, yeah. has the elements of the has the same elements that pe mm -hmm. other people call religion in it. And all religions are a little bit different. Some religions tell you that it's okay to smoke. Others say, no, don't smoke. Yeah. Some religions tell you it's okay to uh, have relations before you're married. Other religions don't. Mm -hmm. Some religions tell you that it's bad to kill. Other religions don't. Uh, all mm -hmm. Right and wrong are very much subjective. 
the uh, I'd say the most compelling argument that I've ever heard for right and wrong that didn't have to do with gods mm -hmm. was majority rule. Okay. But even then, that doesn't... Sometimes that, the majority is really stupid. <laughs> sometimes the majority is stupid, but um, like one of my favorite things that's often said about democracy, democracy is two wolves and a lamb deciding to have what for dinner. Ooh. So one could argue that, okay, by the tenets of democracy, yeah. no, then it is right for those two wolves to eat that lamb. Yeah. Democracy prevails. But on a different sense, a more moral sense, or at least the, the moral sense that I recognize, yeah. no, it is wrong for those two wolves to kill somebody else. But at the same time, mm -hmm. if there's nothing else for to be eaten, if there is only yeah. the two wolves and a lamb, it does seem wrong that all three of them should die mm -hmm. because the two wolves are not willing to eat the lamb. So you are pro-cannibalism. I did not say that. I am pro <laughs> So, in my study of history, there have been plenty of times where mankind uh -huh. has had to not voluntarily, but yeah. resort to cannibalism yeah. or die, and I do not judge any of those people, Spe specifically yeah. in the maritime law. Yeah. Lots of sailors have had to unfortunately eat their fellow crew members. I do not judge any of them. It was that or die. Okay, so, so he, that's a good example. So, using that example, what's wrong with me studying and judging them through today's morals that cannibalism is bad what's so, wrong with that so i should rephrase then it's not wrong to do that you're you have the right to do that you're well, more than welcome harm? to do that the harm is in not understanding uh -huh. the people before you think about it yourself do you today what are the odds that 500 years mm -hmm. from now somebody is going to understand why you voted the way you did why mm -hmm. you spent your money the way you did why mm -hmm. you wore your hairstyle in that picture that somebody has mm -hmm. of you on their wall mm -hmm. uh, a couple hundred years from now because they are likely to not understand you they might say that ugh. He looks so tacky. Ugh, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that hairstyle is disgusting. Or yeah. how could they have possibly voted for this person or that rule or something of that nature? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's so, and to to a degree, we kind of still see this on a smaller scale oh, today. Yeah. The, the youngest generation today doesn't understand why the oldest generation voted the way they did on this, that, or the other thing, or liked this music, or, or liked those fashions. Or my nieces and nephews and children are telling me that I'm a bad person for putting a period at the end of my texts, and that means I'm angry. That's a very good it's example. Not. That was very confusing. <laughs> I don't get it. So yeah, when you when you judge it by today's compass, you are pre it creates the illusion that everybody before us was dumb and stupid mm. and pathetic and bad and pick your unflattering word when you, and you fail to recognize that, like you and I, yeah. they were going through challenges. Like you and I, mm -hmm. they were doing, arguably, they were doing the best they could with what little they knew yeah. and their limited understanding of life, the universe, and everything. And right. they accomplished some pretty cool stuff. How do we know they accomplished some pretty cool stuff? Because we are alive to enjoy even cooler <laughs> stuff than they were. Good point. We wouldn't be able to enjoy their cooler stuff if they were. Um, so this this might get us into a little bit of uh, oh, yeah. Ooh, you this want might to get some us into trouble. So I'm not gonna. No, I was gonna I was gonna use an example that I've seen uh, of a visual aid that a lot of. Oh, okay, I'll say it like. There's a visual aid that's become very very popular of late. Where and I, we might have even mentioned it before. Where it's um, there's a fence. There's three people standing on boxes trying uh -huh. to look over the fence. One is really tall, so he can see well over the fence. One is just high enough to see right over the fence. And mm -hmm. the other is too short, so he can't see over the fence. Mm -hmm. And it's an equality versus equity thing. Yeah. So all three of them having boxes is equal. But uh, in order to make it fair, to be equitable, you mm -hmm. need to take the box away from the tall guy, give it to the little guy, so that mm -hmm. now all three of them can see over the fence. Yeah. So I get that. That is a very accurate description of what equality and equity is, um, in my opinion. Right. But... <clears throat> but uh, it is those tall guys that are sorry, without the t without the tall guy being so high, then all of us are average. All of yeah. us are mediocre. Yeah. And history has proven throughout time that average and mediocre means no innovation, no progress. Oh. It means people just doing the same things that they've always done without anybody coming along, without any revolution to come along and say, hey, we can do something better. We mm. can challenge this thing mediocre means that everybody today still amongst other things thinks that the sun revolves around the earth because there was nobody mm -hmm. who had the achievement to challenge it 
you need to have those every now and then people to be able to challenge things. Mm-hmm. And I, I, that's one of the reasons why I don't like that visual, visual aid, because I think if you take the... I, well, I get the point of the equity, or I get the, the well, arguable morality of the equity. Yeah. If you take that box away, that achiever on his box is the most likely one to come up with another box that will lift that guy up, right. rather than giving up his own and sacrificing innovation Make for the process. Make a new box, don't take away. So think about it. So... Everything that we have as far as plumbing, as far as computers, as far as lights, as far as our understanding of the sciences, of medicine, all comes from people in the past who figured out things that we are getting the benefits from. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's the classic thing about humanity. We usually don't appreciate all the sacrifice, all the literal blood and years and Mm -hmm. people and thought and expenses that went into the things that we take for granted. Yeah. When you live in presentism, you judge those people harshly by, <clears throat> because, and I, I get it because it's very hard for us to understand the world that we lived in. Right. For me to understand what uh, the practice of slavery was like, mm-hmm. it's never going to happen. I know an awful lot about the practice of slavery, mm-hmm. but I've never lived in an experience that can compare either yeah. to the slave or to the master. So I'm never going to truly understand that. Yeah. Therefore, I think to myself, it's not fair of me to judge that. I believe slavery is wrong. If anybody tries to practice it again, right. I'm going to get up there and fight you and say, right. no, we ain't doing that and again. And we can be glad that it stopped. Uh, we can be glad that it stopped. And we can be disappointed that our ancestors didn't do something about it earlier. Yeah. But to say that they were evil because they did this thing... I think is That's unfair. That's just a too far. I, I personally, I think it's unfair. Okay. And slavery is an interesting one for you to bring up because that's such a hot topic. It. it this is one of the things that I love about history. There, or this, uh, this is one of the things that disappoints me about history. Mm-hmm. So, um, I remember a while ago, you've probably heard the saying too. There are some things that you're not supposed to talk about when, like, you get your friends together politics, at the dinner table. Religion. You're not supposed to talk about politics, religion, or whatnot. And I think that that is a lie. Mm-hmm. I think that is one of the greatest crimes mm-hmm. about our society today. If we say that these subjects are taboo, that you're not supposed to talk about them, well, then guess what happens? We don't talk about them. Yeah. And so nothing is learned. Nothing is understood. Nothing is appreciated better. No stories are exchanged. We can't understand each other. You're just supposed to avoid it, which only means more misunderstanding and misconceptions rather than... The rather than those discussions, those chats that I say that I like, yeah. where you and I obviously have different understandings, and we're not allowed to exchange our understandings yeah. so that either of us can get a better understanding. We're both left mm-hmm. to only have our ideology, and if we encounter somebody with something different, we don't know how to talk about them. We yeah. just assume that, oh, well, you're wrong or stupid or evil or whatever the case is because you don't and agree then, with me. And then that pride that we talked about yes. comes in again, both sides and sister, See, right? So Without... Cool. Learning from each other. Yeah. It's messy. This has been a very fun episode. I've enjoyed this conversation. Right? This worked out well. I wish I could have more conversations like this with people. They know who they are, but they're probably not listening. <laughs> it's very cryptic. <laughs> All right. I think that's probably a good place to stop. Yeah, it's I thought you ready. said you wanted this to be a short episode. I know. It did not end up being very short, <laughs> but interesting nonetheless. All right. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, then please subscribe, tell your friends, and leave us a five-star review. If you'd like to hear a future episode with more information about today's topic, contact us on Gmail, Facebook, Instagram, or that uh, Chinese one that I'm not going to name because I'm proud, (laughs) at Married to History Pod. Also, please contact us if you have a silly question idea or if there's something from history that you would love to learn about. I love China. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I've I've talked about this. China is cool. China is a cool place. TikTok. I was talking about TikTok there. I said it. You happy? People just call it the clock app. Really? Because tick. Talk, it's the clock app. I've never heard that. You also aren't on social media. That's true. <laughs> Go All on. Right. What, uh, which, oh, that one. All right. Just be sure to specify in your message if it's silly or serious because we don't want to treat a genuine quest for knowledge as a joke. Talk to you next time. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, you gotta put that away. And turn your phone on silent. Okay, give me a moment. I thought you were ready. I never said that. You should have been ready.
I didn't know how much time it would take for you to be done. Okay, I just need to do one more thing. It's always just one more thing. I need to stop sniffling. Yes, you should stop sniffling. Sniffling is embarrassing. <clears throat> yep. Oh, is this thing recording? Yeah. I always record early. <laughs> we don't ever use this. Yeah, but this is one of those times where, like, you genuinely got me, and I'm like, oh, I have to, like, really ask the question. <laughs> Haven't had to sincerely ask the question in a while. <laughs> I pressed record as soon so as I said. So does that mean it down. got me every time that I said, eh, I'm not ready, or I never said I was ready and all that? It's been a long time since we recorded one of these. It has been. Do we know what we're doing? The, there's a script, isn't there? <clears throat> yep. And then I just add loops, so my part's easy. That's true. Welcome to Married to History, where we try to be in. Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> I was trying to. What do you mean I'm not laughing? I didn't. There is audio evidence that I did not laugh at you. You were looking at me and smirking. I was looking at you, yes. I had a smile on my face, yes. I tried Forgive to not. Me. Take I'm a sure big every inhale. husband listening right now <laughs> knows that, oh yeah, that's unforgivable, dude. Never look at your wife and smile. You can smile, you just can't smirk. What's the difference? There's a difference. You'll have to show me where it is written one day. A dictionary. Just be sure to specify in your message if it's a silly or a, if it's silly or serious, because <laughs> that was really professional. Because we don't want to gag. Uh, let, let, let me take, start take, over. Take two on that. All right. Just. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> right, Good thing I know how to three. edit now. Take three, take three. Put, put, put this in the outtakes. Okay, I'm not great take at editing, three. but I knew how to do it.